dead in Christ shall rise, and those that remain will be caught up in the air to meet him in the air, and there we shall always be with him. Some people see this song as referring to the second coming, others see it as the rapture. I'll let your theology determine that. I think I know which one I believe in. But at the midnight cry, we're going up. Amen. And I have, uh, I'm going to have Terry to try to uh, put the words up. I don't want to just play it. I want you to try to follow the words as I go through this.
God's people said. Amen. Amen. Man, that was awesome. I've been looking forward to it all week. Yeah. Uh, I told Tom, I knew it was gonna, he was going to play because Dennis uh, gives me the lineup the week before. So I've been humming that song in my head all week, listening to it on YouTube and everything. So had all the words ready, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, man, it's fantastic. I don't know about you, but I'm ready. And uh, it's, uh, you know, the Apostle John said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, man. And I say amen to that. Man, thank you, Tom. Thank you very much for uh, sharing that message uh, with us today. Hey, that's, uh, that's our only hope. Amen. amen. That Jesus is going to come back and he's going to take us away to be with him forever. Hey, well, friends, join me today in John chapter 2. Join me in John Chapter 2. We're continuing on in our journey with Jesus, and I'm going to try to start every Sunday with a quote from uh, somebody that I like about Jesus. And today I want to share a quote with you that Rick Warren said several years ago. Rick Warren said this, Pastor of a huge church, I think it's in California, isn't it? Anyway, wherever it's at, wrote the, uh, the best selling book, Purpose Driven Life, Purpose Driven Church. Rick Warren said this, quote, The Bible tells us three things about Jesus Christ. Number one, he came to have my past forgiven. Number two, he came to give me purpose for living. And number three, he came so that I might have a home in heaven. So, end quote. So that's the way we're going to think about today. Think about Jesus Christ. So far in our journey with Jesus, we have seen the babyhood of Jesus. Like I said, Miss Sandy, I don't know if that's even a, a word, but I like it. We looked at the babyhood of Jesus. We saw the childhood of Jesus, which is basically a snapshot. That's all we have in the Bible, so that's all we're going to talk about. So today it's time for us to move on and to begin the adulthood of Jesus. Now on the timeline of our Lord uh, on his earthly life uh, here... We understand that from the ages 12 to 30, most likely Jesus spent his, most of his time as a carpenter, uh, taking care of mom and family. At age 30, we know Jesus was baptized, initiating uh, his ministry on the earth. And then after coming up out of the Jordan River, do you remember what happened? It said that the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And after that, uh, you know, you heard the Heavenly Father say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. After that, the Holy Spirit then led Jesus into the wilderness. Do y'all remember for how long? For 40 days. That's right. For 40 days where He was tempted by Satan. But not one time, friends, not once did Jesus give in to the ploys of the devil. And then after He came out of the wilderness... Uh, angels came and ministered to him. He was re-strengthened, and he was ready to go. And the first thing he did was to begin to call his disciples. Uh, here, where we're going to uh, read John chapter 2, at this time, he had called six of the disciples so far. He called Andrew and his brother, Simon Peter. He called two more brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, or the sons of thunder, as Jesus nicknamed them. And then there were two other fellas, Philip and Nathaniel. So, Miss Cheryl, that brings us up uh, on our journey with Jesus. And I know it's early in the day, but y'all said y'all were ready to go to a party. So, you ready? Ready, oh, ready to go. All right. Uh, I think y'all can handle it. So, we're just going to hear John chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. We're just going to read through the whole thing. We want to take in the whole experience of the day. And then we're going to go back and just walk through it as John presented it to us. So if you can, in honor of reading God's Word, stand with me. I read from the NIV here. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Hey, and most people that don't know anything about Jesus, they know this passage right here. Now on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. But when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. 
But his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Well, nearby stood, some, stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. <coughs> Excuse me. Each one holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So Jesus said to the servants, fill those jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, look, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheapest wine after the servants have had too much to drink. But you, you saved the best for the last. So what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Almighty God, as we look at this passage, as our Lord and Savior begins his earthly ministry, he kind of kicks it off today. God, I pray you will take this passage, no matter how familiar or unfamiliar it is to us. God, use your holy word and your holy spirit. Speak to our hearts using this today. May the devil have no place to snatch it from our ears or from our heart. But may your word go out and do what you would have it to do. God, thank you for the song well, all the songs we sang today. In particular, thank you for the hope we have in the song of Midnight Cry. Wow, when we look forward to that day, we'll no more have to study about you, Jesus. We'll have to no more look forward to seeing you, Jesus. But one day our eyes will behold you. Wow, and what a day that will be. And it's in your blessed, holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thank you. You can be seated. Well, I know all of y'all are pretty sharp, so I know you know what's happening in this chapter right here that we just read. But I'm going to ask you to make sure you know what is taking place here in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The first miracle. A first miracle, but what's exactly going on? Wedding. There's a wedding. Everybody say wedding. wedding. Oh, there you go. There's a wedding going on. Hey, and that's the reason for my attire today. I told a couple of y'all, but uh, this was my official uh, wedding garb. When somebody was getting married, this is what I always wore. Wore the black suit and uh, the pink tie. One of my daughters went, uh, one of my daughters, one of our daughters went to Italy and this is what she brought back to me, man. So I always used it in my weddings. Of course, I always wore a suit at a funeral, too, but we won't go there. But anyway, not the pink tie. But at this wedding, or at this party we're going to be at today, we're going to see Jesus in three different roles. First, we're going to see Jesus as a guest. Next, we're going to see Jesus as the Son, and not so much the Son of God, but as the Son of Mary. And then we're going to see Jesus, finally, as the miracle worker. And again, that's the part most people like. They love the wine, I mean the water, turning into wine. How many times you get that thrown up in your face, man? <laughs> anyway, here we go. If you're ready, say let's go. Let's go. Number one, Jesus the guest. John starts out in verse one. He says, on the third day. Brother John, right off the bat, I wanted to know the third day of what? Well, it wasn't the third day of the week. It wasn't the third day of creation. But rather, from all the studying that I gathered, it was on, I believe, the third day since Jesus had entered this area called Galilee. And it had been three days since he had called Philip and Nathaniel to follow him. I mean, I'd be, and that's in chapter 1, verse 43. You see that. You know, it may not be a big deal to you, but some people read it. They want to know, on the third day of what? Well, it had been three days since Jesus had called Philip and Nathaniel. Well, now I say, you know, we're at a wedding here. Let me tell you, boy, in biblical days, weddings were a joyful, happy time, a most festive occasion where everybody came out and had a good time. Hey, weddings are still a joyful occasion. Amen? Amen. Hey, yeah. Uh, Y'all didn't sound real strong on that, but anyway. Y'all sound kind of like the little boy I read about, Randy. 
This little boy, he went to a wedding with his mom. What could be worse than for your mom to drag as a kid to a wedding? But anyway, he went to this wedding with his mom, and they're sitting there, and everything's going on, you know. The bridal party has all come in. They're standing up there at the altar, and the boy's looking at it. He's taking it in, and he leans over, and he said, Mom, why does a bride wear white? And she whispered back to him, oh, it's because she's so happy. He thought about that for a minute, and then he leaned back up and he said, well, then, Mom, why's the groom wearing black? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's just what you're supposed to wear. Hey, well, y'all know as well as I, weddings come in all shapes and sizes. Some people elope. Some people go to the courthouse and sign the papers. Some people are married in a church. Man, I've had the occasion. I did one wedding in uh, flip-flops and a bathing suit with a t-shirt on by a swimming pool one time. I've done weddings out in a garden where we were smell, swe sweating and melting under the 120 degree Georgia sun. I've done a wedding on a beach. That's one of the coolest ones we ever did. You know, the waves are coming up and people are walking by in bikinis and everything. They just kind of walk up. What's going on up here? We're having a wedding. You know, we've done all kinds of places. I've seen where people spent hardly any money on a wedding, and I've seen where people just shot the wad and spent millions. So you know me, I'm always curious. So I Googled, Miss Sandy, the most expensive wedding ever. And I came upon one site that had the top five that they know of. So I'm just going to share this with you real quick. So if you forget the sermon, at least you'll remember this probably tomorrow. And number five, Chelsea Clinton and Mark Ms. Mesvinsky, in 2010, they spent a paltry five million. Five, hey, that's nothing. That is nothing. And they had a venue that overlooked the Hudson River. Coming in at number four, former English football player, which we call soccer, right? But anyway, football player Wayne Rooney and Colleen McLaughlin. She was an author and a, a what you call it, health fitness guru or whatever video. They tied the knot in 2008 for 8 million bucks. Uh, hey, now get this, band. Get this. They hired a band and paid them 300,000 bucks to pay for 30, play for 30 minutes. So y'all may want to advertise on uh, Craigslist. And they chartered five jets, five private jets to bring the guests in. Number three, uh, Prince William and Kate Middleton, 2011, they spent 34 million. Coming in at number two, it really jumps, 66 million bucks. Two Arab sweethearts, I gotta read their names. Banishi Matal, who at the time, man, her dad was almost the richest man in the whole world, uh, married Amit Bati. They married in 2004. 66 million bucks. How many of y'all like to sing? Hey, check this out, Dennis. They paid the singer a uh, sixty thousand bucks just to sing the wedding march. Hey, man, you wouldn't have to do it a couple of weddings a year. You'd be set. <laughs> After the ceremony, they shot fireworks off of the Eiffel Tower. Spent sixty-six million bucks, and they broke up in twenty thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, but I know y'all are all familiar with, according to this website, the number one most expensive <laughs> wedding of all time took place in 1981. Anybody want to take a shot at who it might have been? Yeah, that's it right there. I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. Prince Charles and Diana, 110 million bucks. They had a guest list of 3,500 people, and they say another 700 million people watched it on TV, and isn't it sad they split up too in 1996. So there you go, man. You can have crazy weddings or you can have simple weddings. Well, let me tell you, weddings in biblical days were a major social event. The celebrating usually lasted nearly a week long. And now get this, the wedding took place on a Wednesday if the bride was a virgin. You know what I mean? She'd never been married before. And it was on a Thursday if the lady was a widow getting married again. They say that autumn was the best time to have a wedding. Why would autumn be a good time for a wedding? Because the great harvest would have already been in. All the crops would have been harvested. There wouldn't be a whole lot of work to do because, you know, they were, ag they were an agricultural uh, people. So there wouldn't be a whole lot of work for them to do. 
The evenings were now cool, so all this stuff put together just presented a relaxed atmosphere where everybody knew they didn't have to get anywhere tomorrow and they were ready to party the night away. Now, the ceremony itself would have taken place like this. They would have waited until dusk when then the groom and his men, they would have uh, traveled across town, most of them carrying a torch, and singing as they went. So you can imagine in the cities there, uh, you know, as they would walk the streets of the city, the houses sit right in the street. So as they're walking down the street, singing, carrying torches, you know, people are sticking their head out the window. What's going on out there? And then, or they'd open the front door, come out on the porch, and they see these guys walk. Oh, it's a wedding. So as they're singing, everybody starts joining in, singing with them. So the whole city, you know, is getting fired up and having a good time with it, getting ready to party. Well, the groom and his friend, they would have gone to the bride-to-be's house. They would have called her out in some big ceremony that it was. She would have come out, her escorts would have come out, her family would have come out, and then they would have escorted them all back to the groom's house where the actual ceremony would take place. Well, they would have the ceremony, and after the ceremony, there'd be a big party, you know, lots of eating, lots of drinking, lots of dancing, lots of singing. It reminds me kind of that movie you ever see at my big fat Greek wedding. You know, it'd probably be something about like that. And now, I don't, and they're the ones, aren't the Jewish folks when they throw the dishes down, throw them in a fireplace? I guess that beats washing them, right? Just throw them, bust them. Oh, you stomp on them. Okay. So anyway, are you getting? Are you are you having a good time so far at the wedding here? Well, verse two, who was invited to this wedding? Mary. Mary. Exactly. John says in particular that Jesus and his disciples were invited. Now maybe I bring too much into this, but this shows me that our Lord was no recluse. He didn't hole up in the house and study his Bible all the time and never go out, interact with people. No, Jesus was a sociable person. He liked people, and people liked him. And say, how do you know that? Because ask Ellen if she was there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> because reading the Gospels, oh, she can take it. Be quiet. <laughs> because just read the Gospels and see. Everywhere Jesus went, there was always a what? A multitude there. Jesus loved being with the people, and they could sense it. He loved, you know, most of the time that he spent was with what the religious crowd called the tax collectors, the sinners, the poor, even the ladies of the night. But his ministry was focused on people, being with them. He taught them every time that he got the opportunity. He healed them when he could. He wanted to get to know them and let them get to know him. He wanted to help them all that he could. So friends, when I think about how Jesus was on this earth, let that be a lesson for us as his followers. Let's let the world know, especially the lost world know, that Christians are friendly, likable, sociable people. We are helpful folks. Let's not be the snobs, you know, that most of them think that we are. Amen? Amen. You know, hey, man, I'll never forget, you know, being in a, a junior choir and uh, Miss McCall, you know, bless I, that lady, I, I hope she got 10,000 crowns. Can you imagine teaching a bunch of junior boys to sing, you know, wonderful words of life? <laughs> wonderful words. You know, we even like that. And she say, listen. How many of y'all like listening to Elton John? You know, we all raised our hand. Oh, we like Elton John. She said, listen, how come you'll listen to him and have a good time, and you come in here and sing about Jesus, and you act like you're ready to cry, and you got a thorn under your fingernail? She said, don't act like she says as Christians. We should be the ones having a good time. Amen? Amen. We got something to celebrate. We have eternal life. The world doesn't have it. So live like we got eternal life. You know, be a light. That will attract people to you. Attract people mostly to Jesus Christ. So we see uh, Jesus and his disciples. They were invited to this wedding. Now in verse 1, tell me the particular city that this took place in. That's right. It took place in, uh, in Cana of Galilee. Everybody say Cana. Cana. 
Canaan. Not a whole lot's known about Canaan. We do know this. Looking at, oh, and I don't know if I have any of you brought your map or not. You don't really need it, but if you go home, you want to draw on it, you can. But if you look in the back of your Bible in the book of maps back there, you'll see that the, uh, the Cana, it is west of the Sea of Galilee. It is east of the Mediterranean Sea. It's five miles north of Nazareth. So it's set almost right in the middle of the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, just north of the city of Nazareth. Now, one thing we do know about the area is they were known for raising figs. How many of y'all like eating figs? Anybody? Hey, most everybody. Y'all like uh, fig newtons? You ever had? You ever had homemade fig? Oh, Elliot likes fig newtons. You ever had homemade fig preserves? Anybody ever had that? Oh man, my mom used to make them. Of course, as a punk kid, I didn't like them. Only appreciated them when I got older. But man, boy, that was nothing better. Let me tell you, Dennis. Put a big old piece of toast in the toaster, let it pop up, and while it was warm, slap the butter on it. Or she usually liked to make them big old cat head biscuits, pop them out of the oven, they're still hot, split them open, the steam rises up. And there wasn't no margarine, man. She's soaking it down with butter. It's just running off the side. <laughs> Dip one of them figs out of there and plop it down right on top of it. Then pour the syrup on top of it. Man, it, it, you're going to die, man, in coma. But man, it was the best. God was the best. Well, they were known for raising figs. And figs were a big deal then. You know, they ate figs all the time in biblical days. They even made uh, what they call a... a a, a, a pole, that's it, poultice. They made a poultice out of figs. And if they had a sore or something, they would put it on that. I guess after you got through with soaking your balls, you need to just eat them. I don't know. <laughs> well, hey, here's something to think about. We're in Cana of Galilee. Now, had you been Jesus' publicity agent, what kind of venue would you have chosen for his introduction into the world? What would you have done? How would you want to introduce Jesus to the world? Caesar's palace. There you go, man. Caesar's palace. You know, I'd have him come. I'd have him descend in a cloud, come down in a cloud, standing on a cloud, or maybe have a fireball explode and Jesus step out of it. You know, like one of them WW wrestlers do, something like that. Hey, you know, have him have him come at a time that would coincide with one of the great feasts, so that he walks into the temple at Jerusalem when the place is packed, you know, and then the lights go off and the bells are ringing and everybody steps aside and Jesus comes out of the smoke. Hey, maybe, you know, years gone by to get introduced to the world, you went on Ed Sullivan, you know, Johnny Carson. We're dating ourselves now, right? But anyhow, you wanted to get kick-started, that's where you went. Hey, Jesus chose nothing like that. Man, Cana was nothing, y'all, but a speed trap. It was even smaller than Nazareth, and I told you how small a city it was. I don't, they didn't even have, at least they had a yield sign in Nazareth. You went through Cana, you never had to slow down. But here is where Jesus chose to introduce himself to the world. Hey, it just goes as John 5, 41 said. Jesus didn't care for the praise of men. He didn't come to be in the limelight. He didn't want to be the center of attention. Instead, as Mark tells us, he came as a servant. He came to seek and to save the lost and the lowly. And where was he going to find them? He was going to find them in the highways and the byways, in the Canas and in the Nazareths. So that's where Jesus went. He went to where the people were and where they needed him. And let me tell you, people today need us as his followers, so we need to be spreading the word about him. So there we see Jesus as a guest. Now we're going to move on number two, Jesus as a son. Jesus as a son of Mary. Hey, y'all, now at this point, Jesus, he hadn't performed any miracles. He hadn't spoken in public. So it may have been his relationship with Mary that got him and the disciples invited uh, to the wedding. We know by reading this passage, Mary had some pull at the wedding, yeah. right? Yeah. How do we know that? That's right. She was telling the service what to do. And whatever she told the service to do, they did it. You know, they did it. She wasn't the maitre d'. That was the master of the banquet. But she did have some pull there. So uh, when they ran out of wine, 
You know, Mary was the one that tried to do something about it. So now she went to Jesus, not to Joseph. So y'all, by his absence there, most commentators, or it might have been like most men, didn't want to go to wedding that day. I don't think so. I agree with most of the commentators that said he was more than likely passed on by now because if Joseph had been there, Mary would have reached out to him. But since Joseph is gone from the scene, since Jesus is her firstborn eldest son, it's now his responsibility to take care of mom. So that's why Mary reached out to him here. Well, let me tell you, Jesus' response to Mary has, a lot, has caused a lot of discussion over the years. Many people see Jesus' reply to her as rude, as disrespectful. But if they think that, it's only because they haven't read it in the proper Greek as it was written, or they've never been explained what's going on here. Most translations, the NIV included, and the King James, I know, it just says, woman, what's that got to do with me? And in our culture, that sounds what? It sounds cold and indifferent, doesn't it? It does say, hey, old lady, ain't got nothing to do with me. I ain't, got, ain't nobody got time for that. You know, leave me alone. That's not it at all. The Greek word for woman is gune. Everybody say gune. 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 Call your wife gune. Not a goonie. <laughs> Call her gune or your husband. It's act, it was a term of endearment. It was a term of affection. Matter of fact, when many men were speaking to their wife, they would call her Gune. So you see, I like the translations, and there's not a whole lot of them that put it this way, but I think they word it best when they say, dear woman, dear woman, or dear mom. It's not mom, it's woman. But it's best translated as dear woman. So don't think Jesus was being a smart aleck. He wasn't brushing her off. We know that Mary wasn't hurt by his response. Because there's never any indication she was offended, that she was put back, uh, you know, and she wasn't hurt in any way. She understood his response as that of respect. But let me tell you, in his response to Mary, Jesus was setting the record straight. That the relationship between her and himself was now going to be different. Whereas before... It was his responsibility to be there, to stay there, and to take care of Mary. But now, Jesus was telling her, look, now I'm coming to do what I came to do. And that is to be about my father's business. You know, I bet when, she, when uh, Jesus said that to her, I bet her mind went immediately back to that day when he was 12 years old. And they found him in the temple. You know, when they thought that he had run away. And he said, I must be about my father's business. So he wasn't being a smart aleck at all. He was just letting Mary know, hey, I still love you, but things are going to be different now. i got to take another route, and that is to do my father's will. So there we see Jesus as the guest. We see Jesus as the son there, you know, with his mom. And now to our last point, the one most people like the best is Jesus, the miracle worker. Hey, now we already know it, but what's the problem here in verse 3? Ran out of wine. Ran out of wine. Y'all said that like it ain't never happened at the house before. <laughs> you know, they ran out of wine. What? We ran out of wine. Let me tell you, in that day, nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing. Nothing, nothing could have been more embarrassing than to run out of food and wine at a party such as this, such a faux pas, practice that all week, I nailed it, such a faux pas, man, would have shamed the wedding couple and their families. And in fact, I read Miss Linda, it would have given them a reputation they probably never would have lived down. Hey, and get this, if you listen, say amen. amen. One guy's even went as far to say that the groom, I'm sorry, in this day, the bride's family didn't pay for everything. It was the groom's family that took care of the tab. But in that day, if they ran out of wine or food, that the bride family, they could have sued the groom's family for not being properly prepared. Now get that. Wouldn't that be a great way to start out the marriage? <laughs> Guys, go to court, you know, and not to sign the papers. We're going to sue because you ran out of wine. 
So they got a big problem here. And in verse 5, Mary turns to Jesus. And she turned to him, I believe, because she knew. She knew that he could and would do something about it. And here's where the servants are introduced because they play a pivotal role in this miracle. You know, and that's the way Jesus is. He didn't come to do everything himself. Amen? Amen. That's why he called disciples, friends. He could have come to this world and done everything he did. He could have done it by himself. He didn't need their help. He doesn't need our help. Amen? Amen. But he does it to allow us the opportunity to take part in being a blessing with him. So here the servants, they get to be a blessing. And it's so great because even when the master of the banquet drank the wine and said, he didn't know where it came from, but all the servants are standing there, so they're going, we know what happened. We know what happened. So here we go. First of all, we see Mary's instructions to the servants. Poor servants, everybody here is telling them what to do. And isn't that the way it is at a wedding? Hey, give me another glass of that. You got any more Ritz crackers back in the back? You know, they're always bossing them around. Same thing happened here. Nothing's changed. But what, y'all, did Mary tell the servants in verse 5? If you don't forget, if you forget everything else I say today, I'm going to make you say this and remember it. What did Mary tell the servants to do? Do whatever he says. Man! Warren Wiersbe said he wanted to use that. Was, yeah. No, it's J. Vernon McGee. I know you like J. Vernon. J. Vernon McGee said he always wanted to do a Mother's Day sermon on that. Mary said, do whatever Jesus said. Let me tell you, if we would only heed that advice, what a different world it would be. Amen? Amen. What a different world it would be. What a different church churches would be. Our homes would be different. Our workplaces would be different. Everywhere would be different if we would just get in God's holy word and just do what it tells us to do. Man, amen or oh me. Do whatever he tells you to do. So that was Mary's instruction. Now Jesus has got something to tell them. Verse 7, what did Jesus tell them to do? That's all I got to Jesus said, hey, go fill those stone pots up with water. I love the way John sets the stage here. He just says, there was no wine, but there were a whole lot of water pots over here. And then I could just see the camera kind of fade away, make you think, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? Well, he's fixing to tell us. There's six water pots there. And after Jesus was made aware of the problem, he looked for a solution, and there was the solution right there. There were six stone water pots that were there, number one, and number two, they were available. Man, Tom preaches an allegorized this passage out of this world, you know, and there again, the pots were there and they were available. Are you and I here and are we available to do what God wants to do with us? So he sees the pots there. there and man, that's the way it's all through the Bible. God always used whatever person and whatever possession that was available for him to use. You think about God went to Moses. He said, Moses, what's that in your hand? Moses said, that's nothing but a stick. God said, that ain't nothing but a stick. And God used that stick to re literally rescue an entire nation. Remember David and Goliath? Remember the story of David and Goliath? What did David have when he went to the giant? That's right, he had a slingshot and five river rocks in his pocket. He used what? God took what David had and what David would use, and he killed the giant. So today, friend, I ask, what's in your wallet? Yeah. No. <laughs> what's in your no, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What talent, what gift, what ability has God given you? Then use it for his glory and for his plan. He's not asking you to be the savior of the world. He's just asking you to use your fingers to bring him glory on the piano. He's just asking you to use your voice to sing his glory. Amen? Amen? So many times we think, I don't have anything, God. You can't use me. You got a car you can drive? There may be a sick neighbor that you can take to the doctor. God says, what have you got? I got a car. 
Can I use it? Yeah, God, you can use it. And as you take that sick friend to the doctor, you can tell them about the Lord. We make it so hard. Amen. It's not that hard to be used by God in great and mighty ways. You can do it. Say, I can do it. You can do it, not by yourself, but when you make yourself available to God. Man, y'all better hurry up. We're going to go into overtime here. So, one last thing about the servants here. They followed Mary's instructions. They followed Jesus' instructions. They filled the water pots up, didn't they? To the brim. To the brim. You caught that. They didn't just haphazardly, you know, take an empty milk jug and pour out water. You know, they filled them to the brim. Like folders. Isn't that the one to fill the cup to the brim? These guys were optimists. I love these servants. Friends, they knew something could and would happen. And they did their part. And what the next thing Jesus says, do you think this sounded crazy to him? Verse 7, he said, fill the pots up with water. And then the next thing Jesus said, now take some of that to the master of the banquet. First of all, they're thinking, we don't need water. We need wine. And if you think I'm going to take a cup of water to the master of the banquet, basically the master of the banquet was their boss. He was their boss. And if they screw up on the job, what's the boss going to do? Fire. He's going to fire them. You can't fire people anymore, but you could back then. That's another sermon for another day. But anyhow, I mean, they took a big chance. Because let me tell you, nowhere does John give any indication Jesus did anything spectacular over this water. He didn't wave his hands over the water. He didn't chant some magical formula. He didn't pick up dirt and throw it in there. He didn't spit into any of them. He didn't stir them with his finger. He didn't even tell them what he was doing. So no matter how crazy it might have sounded, when Jesus told them to do it, they did it. And again, that's another great sermon. I don't care how crazy you think what God has called you to do, do it. Amen? Just do it and leave the outcome to him. Because that's what those servants did. Hey, now, there were how many stone jars there? Six. I'm helping you out here. I know it's getting late. There were six of them. It says each of them held 20 to 30 gallons. I should ask Elliot to do the math because he's quicker at it than me. But I know six times 20 is 120. So these things held at least 120 gallons of water. Gallons of water or gallons of wine. This was so neat. I don't know why I think of what I do, but I just got to thinking. And again, I'm crummy at math. Thank goodness somebody else had already done it. I didn't have to do it. I got to thinking, how, many, how much wine would that be? Today, the average wine bottle I can't remember how many liters it is, whatever, I don't even know. It would, oh, I can tell y'all no. But anyhow, <laughs> it would have been 720 standard size bottles of wine wow. for today. 720 bottles of wine. First they got none, Lance. Now they got over 700 bottles. You're talking about an open wet bar. Man, when Jesus does something, he goes out of the world, amen? He didn't just meet the need. He blew it out of the water. That was way more wine than they needed. And Bicycle John, one commentator, said that the happy couple, they could have took all the leftovers, leftover wine, that is, they could have sold it and had enough money to live on for months. Wouldn't that be great? Get married. You know, you go on a honeymoon for a few days and you got to come back to the real world, start working and pay for it. They could have just laid around done nothing for six, eight months. They'd been like John Lennon and Yoko Ono or something. They wouldn't have had to do anything but enjoy life and each other. Man, all that time. Oh, and you know, this was, you know they could have easily sold it because what does verse 10 say? It was good. It was, who said it? Somebody it said it, it was the, the best. best. It was the best. Again, I got to thinking, you know, I wonder what the most expensive bottle of wine is. Well, in 2000, I know y'all want to know. <laughs> in 2000, at a charity auction, a bottle of Screaming Eagle Cabernet Sauvignon, or what I don't know what that means, 
It went for 500,000 bucks. It's the most high priced bottle according to Guinness Book of World Records. How much would each one of those 720 bottles take in that day? Two quick reflections. I got about a dozen more and then we're done. Number one, friends, I see here what compassion that Jesus had for this couple and their families. Look, he went there as a guest. It wasn't his problem. They ran out of wine. It was no skin off his nose. At the end of the day, when everybody left, he could have left with them. It wasn't going to hurt him any, was it? He could have just walked off and done nothing. But he saw these poor people. They were in a plight. They needed some help. And he did it. Man, I think of what sympathy and compassion he still has for us today. Hey, we know that we know that God is with us in our times of sorrow, our times of sickness, our times of strife, those things we call the big things of life. Yeah, we know God is there with us. But do we really believe he's there with us in the little things? Like when the car breaks down, you don't know how you're going to pay for it. Does God really care? Yes, he cares. Does God care when your kids or grandkids go crazy? Yes, he cares. He knows it and he cares. He cared then and he cares now. What compassion he had for them and for us. And then lastly, something I never thought of before. Here I see the whole point of the miracle. Of what I think he is anyway. Never thought about this before. Jesus, friends, he never did and never does anything haphazard. He doesn't do something just to do it. Kind of like at work we say, do something, if it's right or wrong, just do something. Just do something, whether it means something or not. John makes it clear, the point of this miracle, and we read it in verse 11. Jesus did it so that the people's faith would be bolstered in him. It says he did it so that the disciples might believe. Oh, they already believed in him, friends. Don't think they already didn't. They believed in him, or they wouldn't have followed him. Amen? But by him doing this miracle here, their faith was bolstered. It was increased. It was encouraged. You know? And so when God causes a miracle, friend, it's not just for the entertainment or the amazement of it. No, he does it for the purpose of helping us to believe in him and then to push us to cause others to do the same. You know, has God done anything for you in your life? Has he ever done anything for you? Just tell somebody what he's done. I tell, I've told y'all a thousand times the story of how I got my pickup truck. Until you, you, know, you can tell it as good as I can probably. How, one day I got a call out of the blue and I got a truck. I don't even know who gave it to me. I still don't. Man, I've used that story I don't know how many times. Just to tell people what God can do. And I've had most of them look at me kind of like you are now. Half glazed over <laughs> like, yeah, big deal, whatever. But the bottom line in all of this, I see that Jesus wants to be involved in the messiness, in the brokenness, and in the blessedness of our lives. And don't forget that when he was invited to that wedding, what did he do? He went. So I ask, have you invited him into your life? Because he never goes anywhere uninvited. And if you have invited him into your life as your Savior, have you invited him to come in and to take over your life and to do things so that you can tell others about him? Almighty God, thank you so much for this passage of Scripture. Man, we could literally stay here all afternoon. I got about five hours worth of stuff at home sitting on the table. But God, I just pray you would take what we've looked at today. God, speak to our hearts our minds, our souls, whatever it is. Use this time, oh God, for your glory and for your benefit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.